the only woman in the photo, Frances Perkins and her New Deal for America, by Kathleen Kroll, illustrated by Alexandra Bai. The only woman in the photo, Frances Perkins and her New Deal for America. Little Frances Perkins was shy. She couldn't speak up even when asking for a book at the library or a spool of thread at the store in her cozy New England town. She was most comfortable around her grandmother, who encouraged her to always keep trying. She would say, Take the high ground! If someone insults you and when someone opens a door to you, go forward. So shy Frances tried her hardest in everything she did. Frances was quiet, but she was a watcher and a listener. She was sad to see young Irish immigrants being screamed at and chased by those who hated newcomers. She felt sorry that her best friend's family was not as well off as hers. Her parents said that if you were poor, it was your own fault. But Frances wondered. She couldn't stand the thought of children going hungry or being in pain. And she couldn't see how it was their fault. She knew first aid, and other kids turned to her when they were hurt. She followed her grandmother's advice and always tried to help. Frances was a thinker at a time when higher education for women was new. People feared that women's, quote, delicate bodies, end quote, would suffer if their brains got too big. But her father saw how smart Frances was. He taught her to read at an early age and encouraged her to go on learning. In high school, she mastered tough classes, including Latin and Greek. She blossomed from a whisperer to a star debater. The point was always to challenge herself. Going to college meant the world to Francis, and history course there shaped her future. The professor required students to observe the depressing conditions in the nearby paper and textile mills. Frances was horrified, especially at the small children toiling alongside adults. The experience opened her eyes to other injustices in America, like those she'd glimpsed as a child. But, quote, these were the days when nobody expected the government to do anything, end quote. She said, Frances ached to help. To do that, she realized she had to make her voice heard, even when speaking made her uncomfortable. In speaking up, Frances was learning to lead. Against her parents' wishes, they preferred she started husband hunting. She moved to New York City and began working. A new way to help fight injustice, called social work, was flourishing there. The more she saw, the more she wanted to help. I had to do something about the unnecessary hazards to life. It was sort of up to me. Unnecessary poverty. She started off delivering milk and food to starving children, getting landlords to give a break to those unable to pay their rent, and asking for donations in dangerous neighborhoods. She defended herself with the tip of her umbrella. For these social justice issues to get proper attention, Frances believed women had to get more power. So she went even further. She was a fierce fighter for women's right to vote. She spoke out about suffrage on street corners, bringing her own grocery crate to stand on. She honed her speaking skills, projected her voice, and used humor to deflect hecklers. After getting more education in social work and publishing her own articles on the subject, Frances kept working to protect others by taking a job gathering information on unsafe workplaces. She then visited more than a hundred bakeries. Taking notes, bread, donuts, and pies were baked in airless rooms with dirt floors. Rats nibbled on bags of flour, and cats had kittens on the counters. Dirty water instead of chocolate dripped 
onto pastries. Francis saw sick workers bending over the dough and coughing. Children huddled there with their parents because they had nowhere else to go. She wrote it all down in her report. When she presented it to New York's Board of Health, bakeries were forced to improve conditions. But Frances didn't stop there. Next on her list was fire safety. She inspected 26 laundries, finding danger everywhere. This problem was urgent. It became even more urgent after one horrible day in 1911. Thirty-year-old Francis was having tea with friends when the group heard the charge clanging of fire truck bells and an unearthly shrieking. She lifted up her long skirt and ran toward the scene of a fire. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was burning, and the management, worried about theft, had locked all the doors. The factory employed Italian and Jewish immigrants, mostly women and girls in their teens and early twenties, and they were all trapped. The fire claimed a total of 146 victims. The youngest were only 14 years old. Frances was sick to her stomach and then outraged. To her, this was murder, a tragedy that could have been prevented. If no one else would become the voice for these women, Frances would try. Witnessing the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire turned Frances Perkins into an activist. So intent on helping others that she was ready to enter the all-male world of politics. Former President Theodore Roosevelt was heading up a committee on New York City workplace safety. He'd heard good things about Frances as an expert investigator. So he recommended her to run the committee. She began taking the others on tours of work sites to view firsthand the dangers of greedy managers not protecting their workers. She studied the men she worked with, looking for ways to overcome prejudice. Some men would never treat her as an equal, but if she reminded them of their mothers in her staid three-cornered hat, she seemed to have more success. Her intense study of how men acted was worth it. The committee agreed with her, and the modern fire precautions we have today, glass cases with fire extinguishers, fire exits, fire drills, and water sprinklers began to be required. The city passed the most comprehensive workplace safety laws in the nation. It wasn't long before Al Smith, the governor of New York, rewarded Frances' hard work with her first big break in government. He appointed her to the commission that regulated workplaces across the whole state. She was tongue-tied for a moment, but she decided to accept the job was not just a grand opportunity to make her voice heard on the issues that mattered to her, but it was so significant that it made her the highest paid woman to hold public office in the United States at that time. In her new role, Frances kept arguing for change, helping to pass dozens of laws that made New York safer for workers in copper mines, construction sites, and factories all across the state. In 1929, New York's new governor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, appointed Francis the state's industrial commissioner, overseeing more than 1,700 employees in seven cities. And soon it turned out FDR would need Francis more than ever. When the stock market crashed on Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929, it propelled the nation into the Great Depression. The country suffered as it never had before, about a third of working Americans lost their jobs, then many lost their homes. Francis visited encampments of miserable families living in cardboard boxes and tents. President Herbert Hoover kept making reassuring statements predicting that recovery was around the corner. Francis was furious. She knew it was not and she had to speak up or else people would start blaming themselves for being out of work. In 1930, she called a press conference to announce that Hoover was wrong, and she had the facts and numbers to prove it. Yes, Frances Perkins had just challenged the president. Telegrams and phone calls poured in to criticize her. But she said, I felt the satisfaction of someone who told the truth. 
in, 19, in the 1932 election, Hoover was defeated in a landslide by none other than Francis's boss, FDR. And he wanted Francis as the Secretary of Labor in his cabinet of advisors. He was proposing a new deal, a fresh start for Americans in need, and she was a crucial part of the plan. At 52 years old, Francis hesitated. The challenge seemed extreme, and as the first woman ever to join a presidential cabinet, she would face a storm of criticism. But her grandmother's advice sailed into her mind, and she knew what she had to do. The door might not be open to a woman again, and for a long, long time. And I had a kind of duty to walk in and sit down in the chair that was offered. Challenging herself and using her voice, she realized, would allow her to protect people across the nation and inspire women at the same time. So Frances decided she'd accept the job if FDR allowed her to do it her way. She had been thinking up ideas for years. Now she wrote all her questions on slips of paper, a to-do list for helping the most vulnerable. At their meeting, she held them up and she watched the president's eyes to make sure he understood what she was planning. The scope of her list was breathtaking. It was nothing less than the restructuring of American society. Their talk lasted one hour until he finally said, I'll back you. Newspapers had headlines like, Boston Girl, First Woman Cabinet Member. Sure enough, Francis was now one of the ten most powerful people in government in the whole country. Her Department of Labor was in charge of all matters concerning American workers. On her first day on the job, she took control of her desk, only to find the drawers crawling with the largest cockroaches she had ever seen. It seemed a sign of how corrupt and inefficient the department had been. She rolled up her sleeves, scrubbed her desk, and plunged into working, basically around the clock. At her first cabinet meeting, nervous about how to make herself heard, Frances decided on a quiet approach. I wanted to give the impression of being a quiet, orderly woman who didn't buzz buzz all the time. As she had on her very first committee, she knew she would have to make the other men take her seriously. Finally, FDR turned to her with a smile. Well, Miss Perkins, have you anything to say? Anything to contribute? She spoke softly about her recommendations for reducing unemployment, and after that the men treated her as an equal. Sort of. Some men in her department did threaten to resign rather than report to a woman. Others acted like schoolboys and passed silly notes about her during meetings. One day she testified before Congress and a congressman remarked, She's an awful smart woman, but I'd hate to be married to her. When Frances heard about the insult, she laughed it off, retorting that I hadn't asked him. She had a job to do. The first 100 days were critical. Frances had two phones on her desk and would sometimes answer both at the same time. Mostly, though, she was out of her office initiating a blizzard of big moves, an alphabet soup of agency. agencies. The Civilian Conservation Corps, for example, put more than 2 million young people to work taking care of national resources, stocking rivers with fish, planting trees, and digging canals for flood control. With this and her many other undertakings, it was thrilling for her to see how directly she was helping the people. Wherever she was, at steel factories, on the docks with shipyard workers in California, testifying before Congress, she was a voice for calm. Her goal was to establish a sense of security during a nerve-wracking crisis. She accepted every invitation to speak, feeling responsible for explaining the New Deal to the public. She met with every FDR every 10 days or so. He liked her advice in the form of a story. Who specifically was going to be helped? What exactly would be the result of the actions she recommended? With the story he could then relate to others, he would always support her latest idea. Change was really happening. Magazine headlines hailed Fearless Frances. One called her the woman nobody knows, giving her full credit for the New Deal. In official pictures, she was usually the only woman in the photo. 
Her most far-reaching dream became a reality in 1935 when FDR signed the life-changing Social Security Act into law. It established insurance for old age and for people who lost their jobs. It ensured compensation for those injured on the job. It guaranteed aid to the needy and disabled and even children under 18 in single-parent families. It was, she said, a security structure which aims to protect our people against the major hazards of life. It was basically her entire to-do list. She saw it as a turning point in our national life, a turn from careless neglect of human values toward people working together for the common good. Hurdling one obstacle after another, boldly speaking up, she transformed the government into a force that helped protect people on a gigantic scale. She had reached her childhood goal of helping others. I had accomplished what I had come to do, she declared, hoping to return to a quieter life. But FDR valued her too much to accept her resignation. She was at his side from his first day as president to his last day in 1945. In one of their final meetings, he was crying as he grasped her hand. Francis, you have done awfully well. I know what you've been through, and I know what you have accomplished. Thank you. After his death, she was finally allowed to resign. She kept working for her causes and lecturing at universities, but out of the public eye. I haven't a flair for publicity, Frances said. She absolutely refused to write a book about herself. Once she had said that seeing her picture in the newspaper nearly kills me. She actually stomped on the camera of one photographer who took her picture despite her pleas not to. So when Frances died after suffering a stroke in 1965, at age 85, not many people remembered who she was and what she had accomplished. Social security, fire safety, workplace regulations, and many other laws that keep us safe are things we take for granted, but we should never forget the person who made them happen. A shy little girl who cared about others and grew up to protect them. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe and like so you don't miss another story. If you have a story you'd like me to read, leave a note in the comment section below.